Hello, everybody. Uh, Tim Hughes here. I'm the CEO and co-founder of DLA Ignite. Today, I've got with me Bill Mew, and we're going to talk about um, this this um, the systemic crisis the in systemic, cyber insurance. The systemic crisis in cyber insurance. And yes. What are we going to do about it? And what we're going to do about it? Yes. Um, Bill, where can people find you? Um, I, I can be found all over the place. Um, Bill Mew uh, comes up in Google uh, uh, and in almost enormous number of different guises, but it's probably easiest to contact me as Bill Mew on LinkedIn or at Bill Mew on uh, Twitter. Uh, very happy to engage with you there or uh, by email at uh, bill at crisisteam.co.uk. So, so before we get into that conversation, Bill, you, you've come on here with a picture behind you. <laughs> so, 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 so let let everybody see that picture. What, what, there why don't are. you just explain what that is? This is this is the family castle, and um, uh, I, as a typical uh, uh, Englishman and an eccentric, uh, my home is my castle. Uh, but in this particular instance, we're not talking about a, a, a silver spring mansion that has been passed down from generations. This was built by my uh, parents, uh, my brother, my sister, and I over a sort of 10-year DIY project. There wasn't even a lake or an island or a building. Uh, we uh, invested 10 years of hard labor. Uh, a number of uh, second-hand dumper trucks and bulldozers were used. Uh, I think we got through two dumper trucks, or four dumper trucks and two bulldozers to do it. It took 10 years, it's a labor of love, but it's now a beautiful castle, an island and a lake in the East Sussex countryside. So so, so looking at your, your background, you've been a, um, a officer in the Royal Navy. You worked at IBM for 16 years in financial services. You've done a whole load of stuff around cloud. You've been particularly pulled into a number of privacy campaigns that we can't talk about. And you particularly focus on cyber crisis, which is one of the things that we're going to talk about today. G give us a, 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 an overview of your journey, because it sounds just amazing. OK, well, I, I spent uh, a few years in the Royal Navy. Uh, unfortunately, I was somewhat ill and had to come out and had to find something useful to do. Uh, and, and failing that, I went into high tech marketing. <laughs> and I went I did that for a number of years, going through a, a number of different tech firms and ending up at a, at a place called IBM, which some uh, people will be familiar with. Uh, I, I led IBM's global financial services sector. Um, and uh, it, uh, it's hardly a secret that um, occasionally IT systems go wrong. Um, and uh, uh, not only was I in charge of uh, uh, protecting the IBM brand and, uh, and evangelizing the, the, the best use of IBM technology, uh, but I was also did a great deal of time uh, uh, covering up when, uh, when things went wrong and, and smoothing over uh, various different minor crises. Um, and this was a, a set of skills that I brought with me. Um, and uh, since then, I've, I've been a, the, the cloud strategist at the largest cloud firm in the UK. I've been a big strategy guy. I do an enormous amount in that sort of arena. Um, I also campaign on the privacy front. And it's, the privacy is something that's very important to me. A lot of my ethos is balancing um, meaningful protection. And it has to be meaningful, whether it's privacy, cybersecurity, digital ethics, with the maximization of economic and social value. So looking at digital transformation, cloud and everything. So it's not I'm not a privacy campaigner for privacy's sake. There has we have to strike the right balance. So let's get into the the, the, the meat of what we wanted to talk to, about today in terms of cyber ins insurance. I mean, ex explain to, to the to people like me who know nothing about it what 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 the, the problem is here. Well, uh, most areas of insurance, we've got a pretty good idea of the risk. So if we've got a teenager in a Lamborghini or a Ferrari, we can very easily identify that as pretty high risk. If you've got a home, as we have behind me here, with a drawbridge um, in the middle of a lake, we can probably reduce the, the premiums on that in terms of burglary. Um, but so... You, you can actually work to a large extent, certainly in motor insurance and areas like that, with a really large amount of data, which has been developed over a number of years, uh, that to, to, in order to help us guide and, and price risk accurately. In the cyber arena, um, one of the concerns I have is, first of all, um, the ways in which um, companies are actually pricing risk and, and measuring risk is fairly crude. Um, secondly, that um, uh, what they're doing in many instances to 
cover their backs because they know it's crude and, and fairly inaccurate, uh, is including any number of policy exclusions that um, can really uh, uh, almost nullify the worth, worth uh, of the uh, policies themselves. And finally, I, I think we're, we're, there's a limited book of business there and, and there's increasing concern, not only that there are certain per perverse incentives in the market, but that the market simply isn't uh, robust enough to survive a, a major incident like WannaCry again. Right. And 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 so what, you know, if, if, if we know little about the insurance and the insurance we're buying, what, what is it that what, what what's the knowledge that we're suddenly going to need to get hold of to actually make sure that because everybody lo loves to exploit people's ignorance, don't they? Well, the, the, the problem we have here is if you're a very large company, um, you're one of the FTSE 500s, we can send in an audit team who can do a, a fairly good level of assessment and they'll get a pretty good idea of the level of risk. And during this particular exercise, they may well uncover some potential vulnerabilities that your own team hadn't seen. So it could be a really useful exercise. Um, the problem is that this is a really expensive thing to do. Uh, and you can't do it for mid-sized uh, firms and you certainly can't do it for the mass market. And therefore, when you're seeking to price risk for other organizations, um, there are a number of ways that they've done it. There are, there are risk rating systems, which uh, are meant to act a bit like Moody's or Standard & Poor's do for credit risk. Um, and they go out and assess you and give you a score. Um, unfortunately, these use web crawlers that go across the web, web looking at externally facing endpoints and, uh, and measure them for uh, uh, the, the, the number of patches that you've done and, and whether there are any known vulnerabilities. Uh, this has been described by some experts as uh, assessing fire risk um, from a, a photograph taken from the opposite side of the building, from the, the, the opposite side of the street. Um, yeah. And you can see how big the building is, what it's made of, but you don't know anything about what's going on inside. You don't know if it's got a sprinkler system. You don't know if it's got hazardous chemicals or flammable liquids. You, you, you're just completely in the dark. And therefore, this is, it's known to be, even by the insurers themselves, an incredibly crude manner, manner of doing it. There are slightly more sophisticated tools that could be used that are, are like elaborate questionnaires that go into great detail. Um, but the accuracy, again, is somewhat crude. And um, uh, uh, it's just not as easy to accurately assess risk um, on this sort of basis. And therefore, the insurers don't know what they're doing. And, and we've seen a, an interesting number of, uh, of tactics used by insurers recently. Um, uh, First of all, they can include insure exclusions, and some of these exclusions can be um, enormously varied. Um, and, and I've got a couple on, on screen here. Um, yep. to, just to give you an idea, uh, they will exclude anything that um, includes other than you. So specifically, it, it has to be a target that only goes for you. So if it's a scattergun approach like WannaCry, then you could well be excluded. Uh, and this is the norm because this is the, the, the sort of a, 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 a tactic that most hackers use. Um, they exclude anything to do with the cloud. Um, so any failure by uh, a, a cloud or infrastructure provider, unless you actually own and in control of the hardware and software your, yourself. Well, everybody who uses the cloud, and most of us do, have a situation where we don't own the, own the hardware and software, AWS or other people do. Yeah. It, it's, uh, they also exclude anything that's unlimited liability, because obviously if something goes terribly wrong with one of your systems, as we saw with solar winds and other things like that, they want to be able to pursue the people who are at, uh, at fault here. Um, and uh, we're in a particular situation where actually if you were, uh, uh, look at any of the um, uh, uh, contracts we have with third parties, none of them open themselves to unlimited liability. So that would exclude all of that. Um, any out of date software, and this can be used. Um, let's say you've got a, like most of the NHS, you may have a, a, a Windows uh, a 7 or XP machine in, in the corner quietly whirring away. It may not be the attack vector in a particular incident, but the very existence of a, 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 an outdated terminal like that can ex uh, mean that your insurance is nullified. Uh, they also ex exclude any insider threats. 
um, uh, uh, internet service providers, acts of war. And, and this has been used simply to identify attacks that have come from Russia or elsewhere. And, well, that's where most of them are coming from. Where most of them uh, come from, yes. Yeah, um, uh, or you can exclude pre-existing conditions. So, um, and this is this can be enormously difficult because if you had to put a, together a business case to show that you needed cyber insurance when going to your board, anything you identify in that business case that you presented to them before the cyber insurance, the insurers can then say was a pre-existing condition that you knew about in advance and therefore is excluded. So all the reasons you got the insurance are not covered. So, so what 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 is it that we can do in terms of um, making sure that we actually have the cover then? Well, I, I think I think we, we we need to look very very carefully at um, also what is covered. Uh, I mean, uh, in a number of the the instances we saw with Norsk Hydro, they had cyber insurance and they were covered for an incident that cost them seventy six million, and the payout was only for three point six million because it only covered the fix at the beginning. And so basically, if you've got a, 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 a motor incident and you're hit down as a, as a pedestrian, you'd expect um, to, to be covered by some, the, the insurance and, and some sort of support. But incident response in this type of instance means they'll stretch you to the side of the road to make sure that you're not run over again. Um, you might expect that they'd actually put you in an ambulance and get you to hospital or that they'd get you assessed by a doctor or possibly they'd give you life-saving surgery. But all of the extras aren't necessarily included in the cyber policy. They might just uh, cover the initial fix to stop that attack and none of the damage to your data, none of the damage to your reputation, nothing, nothing besides. Even the legal costs or the, the ransom itself typically aren't covered. So what what are you what what are we doing in terms of um, um, risk incentives then? Well, I, what what we we're looking at is uh, we've got a, a number of other perverse areas where, uh, unfortunately, clients that take out insurance tend to reduce their um, spending on cybersecurity. This is because um, the guy who's got the budget to cover will typically say, well, hey, this comes out of my cybersecurity budget. I'm not getting any more. So the moment I'm spending money on cybersecurity, I'm or on cyber insurance, I'm spending less on cyber um, security itself. And therefore, perversely, I'm a bigger risk. So that is a perverse incentive that people actually say, oh, well, we're covered by the cyber insurance. We don't need to worry as much. And secondly, where you have incident response teams or legal teams or whatever support is recommended by the insurer, obviously these people are appointed by the insurer themselves and work for the insurer, not for you. So if they're doing some sort of uh, 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 emergency technical assessment of what's gone wrong, if du during the process of doing so, they discover one of these um, uh, failures that would exclude your cyber insurance policy, they're going to point this out to the insurer and nullify your insurance. So you, they're not effectively working for you. Um, so you, we need to, to be very wary all of all of this. And, and as a result, we're seeing um, a lot of exclusions appear, as I mentioned earlier. We're seeing premium uh, inflation as insurers are desperately trying to um, uh, cover their backsides and in, in, increase premiums so that they're covered. Or we're seeing market exit. And only in the last um, a few weeks of these last couple of articles here, we've seen uh, these tactics employed by um, uh, insurers on a very large scale. Um, so one of the things that we also need to understand is that Cyber insurance uh, incidents are different. We need four-step approach. We need to fix the problem uh, and provide cyber uh, forensics so that we know exactly what the problem is. Those cyber forensics probably need to be used to develop a legally defensible narrative so that you're legally covered. This then needs to be employed by a, a, a reputation management service. And then finally, um, you need to combat the sort of level of misinformation and hysteria that you're going to get. Uh, and you need to understand that uh, most companies think or they believe that a, a standard crisis management approach will work for them. But if you're going to be in a very different situation for a cyber incident, you're going to be on the back foot. Um, things could be very public before you even know about it yourselves. It could be reported on the web. 
um, the incident uh, aren't necessarily instantaneous. You may well have had your system breached and you won't know about it until you discover it sometime later. And the, the average time is something like 200 days. And you just need to understand that you're going to get the blame for any sort of incident, which isn't actually the case in most incidents. Because um, you, you talked... I was going to say, oh, OK, you get moving yeah, on. We're, to, I'll, I'll change it very, very briefly, and then we'll, then we'll stop the slide work. Um, mm. What I talk about here is imagine that you've got a bank. Uh, a, a bank holds a whole lot of money, and the customers need to go and access it. But occasionally, you're going to get some guys wandering with, with guns, wanting to withdraw their not, money that they're not entitled to. When the press report this, the press have a very simplistic view to all stories. They look for victims and villains. In this particular incident, uh, the guys with the guns are obviously the villains, and the bank and its customers are obviously the victims. Easy. All you have to do is wheel out an executive to show empathy for your clients and your staff and whatever, and everyone will show you sympathy because you're obviously the victim of a crime. Um, and, and it works every time. But take the same bank and imagine that they have a cyber incident. Um, they get hacked. Uh, uh, in this particular incident, you, nobody knows who the hackers are or when it happened or much detail about how it was done. Um, and they possibly won't know this for some time to come. So the immediate reporting is almost all exclusively that the bank is the victim or the villain um, because the bank um, didn't prevent it from happening. So it's, it's a very, very rare occasion where you may be the victim of an actual crime, but in the eyes of the press and the public, you are the villain. Um, and this is this is a, a real problem for, for, for most of us in this particular uh, guise because companies aren't well set up and prepared for this sort of thing. But anyway, what we tend to focus on, therefore, is actually guiding um, clients, A, to be a little bit more aware about cyber insurance, the fact that we believe the market is broken here, um, that it won't survive another major attack, and there are a number of perverse incentives. And we're seeing that uh, in insurers themselves, desperately either having exclusions, raising premiums, or exiting the market entirely. Um, we'll also need to, to, to uh, 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 make people aware of the fact that they need to be prepared in advance. They need to have a, 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 a detailed knowledge of how they're going to respond to this side of incident because it's, it's not a question of if it's probably when it's going to happen and it may already have happened if you don't discover a, a, an incident typically for 200 days you may already have been hacked and you're going to find out about it at some point in the future so you need the rapid reaction service you need the cyber law you need the reputation management and you need the sort of uh, social response service and and all of these, they need to be specialist cyber capabilities. Because as I said with that bank incident earlier, if you have a generalistic approach to sort of uh, crisis management and think it's going to work in a cyber incident, you're in for a shock. Yeah, I, I can see that. And I can see that um, um, that a lot of us are not are not ready for this. And, and you know, your general, uh, we're going to, um, um, you know, when... Businesses, you know, there's always there's issues with businesses. There's the problems always happen, um, and it could be something, you know, like was it was it I can't remember which company it was, so I won't name anyone. The one where they insisted that the um, um, all of the people in security wore flat shoes or something like that, and it hit the um, it hit the um, the press, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And there would be a certain amount of uh, reputation um, limitation that would be done. But that would be pretty much general, as you said, where the cyber, I can see that the changes that are taking place, the victim and the villain is is, is going to have an impact and, and not your generalistic um, out, output is going to work. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, this isn't a problem that's going away anytime soon. The number of cyber incidents is rapidly increasing. Ransomware is becoming a, a, a massive a, 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 an epidemic of its own. Um, and I think we're going to be seeing problems like this escalating with insurers either exiting the market or, or using tactics to try and cover their backside. We can't rely on cyber insurance and we need to look at being prepared. Now, this is a combination of doing 
rehearsals yourself. You're actually mandated by GDPR to do uh, simulation exercise or, or to make sure that you're ready for this sort of thing. And also having the, the fun of some such as ourselves, who are the specialists in this field, who are actually going to save your backside when it happens uh, and not um, falling on your, resting on your laurels and assuming that the normal approach to any other type of incident is going to work in this particular instance. Hmm. Uh, and, and I think having that, you know, you've got a very clear approach, um, and and I can and I can understand that. There was a, I was watching something at the weekend about um, the BBC were investigating Russian hackers and that, and um, you know, it, it's it's it ain't going to go away. No, I, I think we're going to see far more of it. I, I, it's not a simple problem to solve. And it's not. And, and my sympathy goes out to the insurers because actually uh, the, the difficulties you have in assessing the risk are just as great as the difficulties you have in preventing uh, these incidents occurring. So it, it's not a simple solution. So we've if, had, if, a, there was had a, a, if there was an easy answer, we, we, we do. We'd be able to address it right now. We've had a question from um, Asif. Yeah. Um, how information uh, asymmetrics impacts the assessment process during the underwriting the policy? Um, that, well, there, there are a whole load of uh, asymmetric impacts. There are a whole load of potential scenarios. Um, a lot of scenario planning is important in assessing your crisis preparedness. But at this moment in time, uh, the way in which a lot of um, uh, the risk assessment is done simply doesn't cover any of this. And therefore, um, when, when it comes to underwriting policies, um, there's a very inexact process. I mean, even the likes of uh, Warren Buffett has admitted that um, uh, in cyber, the, the insurers simply don't know what they're doing and that the whole uh, arena of cyber insurance is going to go a, get a lot worse before it gets better. Well, Bill, thank you so much for that, and, and Asif, thank you so um, uh, thank you so much for your um, your question. Bill, it's been it's been insightful. Thank you so much. The, the twenty minutes up, it goes very very quickly. Um, remind people where they can get hold of you again. Uh, it's, try at Bill Mew on Twitter or I'm going uh, to add your slide. Oh, there we the go. Final slide. <laughs> um, look, I, I would advocate that people either get in touch with me or with somebody who can give them this sort of expert advice, because um, if even the cyber insurers are, are largely in the dark, um, most of their clients are as well. You need the sort of expert guidance and expert support. Um, there are some really good skills out there, um, certainly in uh, the rapid uh, response side. Of There's a lot of technical skills where um, uh, the, it's easy to find people. Um, but as you go along further along those four steps, it becomes more and more difficult. So reach out. I'd love to hear from you. It's great to chat with you, Tim. Um, and I hope we've been able to um, uh, enlighten people with what I think is a fairly I'm, uh, I'm important I'm sure we have, Bill. It's, it, it, I, I've, learned, I've learned loads, so I'm sure the audience have as well. So there's been excellent. Thank you so much. And, I, and, and I'm just absolutely... Um, uh, I'm speechless with your castle, with your dad's castle. Well, um, I look for maybe we'll get you down sometime. Uh, meantime, it's, it's just amazing. <laughs> it's a bit of fun. A great, great deal of um, uh, British eccentricity um, always, always goes down well. But thank you so much today, Bill. Thank you so much.